Welcome to a very special episode of Inside Outlook. Today we have teamed up with the Caucus and the world famous Jade Garden Restaurant here in Seattle's Chinatown ID to host Washington State Governor Jay Inslee in an informal town hall discussion. The caucus, which claims no political affiliation, is made up of a loose network of community members, which meets up periodically to discuss current affairs. Today, the caucus will be tasked with coming up with the questions to be asked of Governor Inslee, which will no doubt range from McCleary and the funding of education to criminal justice reform, the environment, and immigration. A unique format for both the governor and caucus participants, this is an episode you will not want to miss. I'm your host, Gavin P. Sullivan, Stay tuned. Alrighty, I want to thank you guys all for coming out to the caucus and this hybrid event with Inside Outlook. How is our governmental system impacting climate change, our inability to think past four years into the future? And where are those dollars really going to go? Every time we say we're going to pull from one pot and we're going to put it over here to help people who are struggling or disadvantaged, it's, it ends up sitting on the table and they're fighting over it for years before they do anything about it. I like the revenue aspect to your question, like, where's the money going to come from? Where's the revenue going to come from to, to adequately support mental health services? The issue of marijuana legalization is really critical for this area in particular because with legalization, the profit's going to people who are very politically connected and uh, not representatives of any communities of color at all. And, and so it's kind of like, on one hand, we were demonized for 20 years as based on this, and now we're excluded. So it's rare that we would get the opportunity to talk to somebody like the governor one-on-one. -on -one. Charter schools is a good question, though, because that is, you know... Well, no, but he's not going to give you any answer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like one of the, the arguments is charter schools aren't the answer. There are some that are really bad, and you know what? You're right. Well, there's public schools that are there. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. But, yeah, yeah. but there are some charter schools that are tremendously successful. Yeah. Can we just talk about how we're going to phrase that second question? Sure. So I think how we can improve representation in Eastern Washington and why it hasn't been done already. Um, and then our first question is still regarding relations between law enforcement and immigrant communities. Yeah, open with like, given like the political discourse in our country right now being so divisive, kind of how can Washington as a leader in absorb, you know, in uh, resettling refugees kind of uh, show the way to the rest of the country? My job here is complete. <laughs> Caucus, we'd like to give a very big warm welcome to Governor Inslee, who has joined us here tonight to uh, speak with us and answer your questions. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Uh, this is good to be here. This is my own stomping grounds. My dad used to teach at Garfield. I used to have a job at Franklin working with young people. This is kind of hometown. So thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to discussion. I know you guys are going to have all the answers, and I'm looking for those. So I know that I have come uh, to the right place. I am yours for the taking. So what we'll do is we'll start with the education table over here. All right. The Paramount, it's the Paramount table of the restaurant. So basically, my question is you can't deal with um, education in the state without, you know, somehow grappling with McCleary. And McCleary has always kind of loomed in the background. And we haven't really made any progress on doing that. And it's kind of holding up a lot of other state funding, state things, because no one really wants to be able to do anything until you can solve McCleary. But you really haven't done anything. I mean, can you have some kind of specific steps of what you want to take to kind of solve it? Yeah, well, I'll start with uh, where we are in education. I've got to push back against your characterization quite a bit, though. Uh, not only have we done, uh, not done nothing on McCleary, we've done $2.2 billion of new investments toward uh, the McCleary decision uh, since I've been governor. 
So when I came in, I wanted to, to uh, really improve the educational lot of our kids. I wanted to attack this persistent opportunity gap, which is unacceptable to me. It's unacceptable to me that poverty sometimes has been destiny. Well, you've got to stop that. We've got to give our kids uh, more access to higher education. We've got to increase early child education. We've done all these things. So uh, contrary to popular belief, we actually have done a lot of McCleary, which is $2.2 billion of new money. But we have more to go. One, we've got to get this task force to complete their work to come up with a price tag on McCleary for the last step of this obligation. When we get that, I will then prepare and present to the legislators a balanced budget in December, and it will have a funding plan to fund the, the full last steps of the McCleary decision. We're not, we're not just interested in satisfying a judicial decision. We want to improve the educational outcomes of our children. And I'm really uh, chomping at the bit. All right, can going. I do a little pushback on that to say sure. you're not really solving the fundamental problem that the court sought of relying on local property taxes. Do you think that's fundamentally unfair, and how do you think you can change no, that well, system? Well, I, I, I thought that was implicit in your question. Obviously, but we're going to really do that. It. Obviously, <laughs> we're going to do that. We are going to replace local levy money with state dollars. We're going to add state dollars to the transportation kitty of the education of our kids. And when we do that, it's possible to lower local levies so the schools are not so dependent on local levies for basic education. So clearly we're going to put additional billions of dollars of state money into our local school districts. And uh, we've got to figure out the best way to do that that's economically productive. Great. Thanks. Let's move on to the next table, institutional racism. Um, Governor, one of our questions uh, concerns the relationship between the war on drugs uh, legalization of marijuana and the impact that it's had on uh, low-income communities of color. Um, during the war on drugs, just during its, during its peak, our communities were targeted and demonized, and now, post-legalization in the state, the profits that are being reaped are being reaped outside of our community, sometimes from within our community, yet we're excluded from that. So what we're wondering is, what would be your steps or your approach to perhaps addressing this, uh, these past imbalances and injustices? Well, look, this is a, a huge issue in our society, and criminal justice is just one of the places where we got to improve the lot of minority people in our community. We want to break the cycle of, of reoffense in the criminal justice system. We have the longest jail times for property crime in the United States. We have the longest jail time for property crimes, and this has a very disproportionate impact on minority communities. But we also have the highest recidivism rate. What happens when you have the longest prison times, no supervision, no vocational help, no problem to get rid of your addiction, you end up with the highest recidivism rate. We want to prevent crime. We want smart things to prevent crime. Then we got to deal with the multiple things in our law enforcement issue. Uh, one of which is to give better training to police officers so they're trained how to de-escalate problems so that when they go into a community that they can end up de-escalating violence rather than increasing it. We've got to look at some accountability issues. Uh, we have a, a very unusual accountability measure for officers when there is violence. We've got a lot of work to do here. Uh, what kind of bike jersey you got there? I'm, I'm a fan of bike jersey. That's uh, a good looking bike jersey. Uh, I've delivered Jimmy John sandwiches. All so right. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Do you guys have a follow-up question? There's so much going on, you know, federally and locally with so many like race and equity initiatives and training to make sure our legislators and staff members are, you know, racially sensitive. You know, our diversity commissions at the state, there's like two, three paid staff members. What are you going to do to build capacity for that? And how are you going to bring them to the table when you have discussions? About well, race? I'm proud of the work we're doing to bring diversity to state government. A few months ago, I convened uh, the top 100 uh, leaders in state government on our essentially a diversity training. The last day of our training, we had the people, about 100 people, fill out a questionnaire and they asked, have you ever experienced this? Uh, have you ever been experienced being followed around a store like you're a suspect? Have you found you weren't getting somebody waiting on you when you're looking at a car to buy? There are like 50 of these incidents in your lives. And then we lined up around the room uh, to find out who had had what incidences. Well, I had had virtually none of those things ever happen to me. I'm a white male. I'm 65. I'd never had any of those 50 things happen to me. 
I actually marked one down just so I didn't look like I was an idiot. So I put one down. So I was standing way over here on this end of the room. And as the room moved the other side, it started to get a little diverse. Started to see some people of color. And on the far end was my chief counsel, a guy named Nick Brown, who's a brilliant lawyer. He's my attorney. And he'd experienced, I don't know, 42 of those things out of those 50 bad things that had happened to him in his life. So our lives have been very similar. But he'd experienced all of these things that as a, a white male, I just had never experienced. And this isn't today, this is 2016, right? This is not in Selma, Alabama in 1934. This is in Washington State in 2016. And that was enlightening. And I think that we have to uh, do what we can to get all of us to understand our, our uh, diverse experiences, and that's key to our success here. Uh, moving on to housing. Governor. Um, you've supported the Housing Trust Fund in the past. In the next year, will you support the Housing Trust Fund at the $200 million level? Well, I have been trained at the risk of uh, life imprisonment not to commit $2 to anyone until I actually get to my budget. Okay. But I think you can tell that I have a profound understanding that we've got to increase funding for the Housing Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. I've been a stalwart supporter of it. We've done well on it while yep. I've been governor. But we've got to keep it up. We've got to focus on um, low-income housing because every time rents go up $100, Homelessness goes up 18%. It's like a direct correlation. And rents have been going up dramatically here, and we're seeing consequence uh, increasing homelessness. Now, let me tell you about a threat, and you're well aware of this threat. The, house, the local housing communities are supported by a thing called the, the document recording fee. We pay a recording fee when we file a document, and that goes in to help communities provide low-income housing. Uh, one of the parties uh, has uh, resisted making that permanent. And they've prevented giving us a stable funding of housing. I hope we can succeed on that, making sure we have a stable source of funding for low-income housing for our communities. That's very, very important. So I hope you can help me on that next year. Yep. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Let's move on to our economy desk over here. My group, we were talking about a number of things. And what we were kind of agreed on is, is concern about social issues, where the funding is going to come from to help people with mental health issues, to help addiction issues, where is that funds going to come from? Well, first off, uh, this is very near and dear to my heart. We need a general fund that can support both mental health and education. What has happened in the past is when the state has gotten into trouble, they've cut mental health budgets to do other things. I stopped that. I prevented that from happening, and I stopped the legislature from cutting those funds. Now we have to rebuild those. Now where that, those funds come, look, they come from all of us. They come from when we pay sales tax, they come from when we pay property, or, you know, all of our taxes, b and taxes, that's where the money comes from. But listen, these people who have mental health problems, they're family members, they're not statistics. Their sons are daughters, they're neighbors' kids. So this is an investment worth making, and I'm going to look forward to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Governor Paul Shikofsky, um, yeah. what specific proposals will you have to get revenue? What uh, tax incentives will you cut? Will you look at a clawback on the $8.7 billion Boeing incentive? Um, where does the money come from specifically? In order to answer that, we need some additional information. The first one is what is the price tag on the last step of McCleary? Then I've got to look at the economic forecast and look what the projections are for our economy. And that then can project what revenues we have. Now, it is my hope that those revenues are going to continue to grow like they have in the past. I hope that will continue. And that's going to be the primary source, I hope, of revenues. If that is inadequate, then we look at some loopholes. And there are some corporate loopholes that make no sense anymore. Let me give you an example. This is just one. Uh, Forty years ago, the legislature passed a, uh, an exemption that was supposed to help the forest products industry. It turned out the oil and gas industry poached it, was using it, was using 95 percent of that whole thing. Now it goes in the oil and gas industry. That ought to be closed. And you hope that a combination of those things can solve the problem. Now, if they don't, then you got to look at other places. How about capital gains, Governor? I think capital gains is a better proposal if you had to do something. Now it's important. I'm not proposing that tonight because we don't know that it's necessary. 
but it is a better proposal than a property tax increase. I'll tell you why. If you do a property tax increase, you hit nurses, new young teachers, truck drivers, minimum wage workers, you hit everybody. It's not a progressive tax. Look, we have the most regressive tax system in the state. We should not make it more unfair. Capital gains would be a much more fairer proposition. Now, again, I'm not proposing that tonight because we don't know that's necessary. So uh, that's a possibility. Thank you. We do have water here at the caucus, Thank you. just so you know. Gender equality. Hi, Governor. My name is Jennifer. In terms of gender inequality, the pay gap is my biggest concern, and I feel that it's very, it's very tied to um, paid leave for parents, that when women have paid leave and men don't, it does put an unfair burden on women. I talk to numerous progressive small business owners who feel, that, who feel they'd rather hire a man than a woman because they're worried about what happens when she goes on a maternity leave. And I'm just wondering if there are any state plans for a paid paternity scenario um, over and above what we have right now? Yes, the answer is we have a grant now that is uh, that we are actively uh, researching this issue to try to see what the next step would be to try to get paid family leave for both genders. And that does have a big impact on pay equity. I, I just, I think you're entirely correct about that. Everyone knows like there's only like three countries in the whole civilized world that don't allow parents to, to have this benefit to establish this re relationship with our children. And we know that's an absolutely magic time. So I'm hopeful when we get this report back, we'll talk to the community, we'll have a conversation, we'll see what the next step is. I hope we can succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for joining us. Um, you know, our community members in the LGBTQ community, specifically uh, of the transgender who self-identify as male, female, or, um, or other, um, having uh, uh, issues with accessing bathrooms that, in which they self-identify. And, and, and how do you kind of create a space for uh, progress to happen? Well, uh, mine is only one voice, but it happens to be the governor's. <laughs> and I'm not shy about using it. Uh, there is one thing that Washington State stands very firmly on, is we're against discrimination, period, end quote. So I have uh, uh, very uh, vocally and, and robustly pushed back against those who want to embrace the North Carolina style of discrimination, which would allow discrimination against people who are, are transgender. And, and I think that what we're seeing is, is that schools are able to help children preserve their dignity and respect without interference by the legislature in North Carolina or anywhere else, if we will just allow them to do so. There was an effort to put an initiative on the ballot that would have enshrined discrimination in this state. They could not get the signatures. That was a good thing, and I'm happy about it, and I'm going to keep standing this way. Move on to our immigration table and our high school representatives. Hello, my name is Kathleen. Um, so our question is, given the current divisive political discourse, um, how can Washington lead the nation in embracing our immigrant um, communities and improving the relations between uh, law enforcement and immigrants? Thanks for coming here. I appreciate young leadership here. This is a really important question because uh, I believe that one of the great secrets of the <laughs> state of Washington and, and our country is understanding the strength of immigrants and adding to our community. Look, we got a, a guy who's been nominated by one of the major parties that wants to shut the door. Now, what you do about that is you speak against that type of, of fear. So when 36 Republican governors basically said we should shut the door to, to refugees who are Muslim from Syria, I said, no, we should keep that door open. People need to speak up against wrongs when they see it, and that's what I've done. And I hope you'll do the same every chance you get. And I look forward to you when you run for governor. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till I'm done. <laughs> Last but not least, the environment table. Um, so we have this cockamamie economist who came up with an idea to put 1500 bucks in every working family's pocket and make the most regressive tax code in the country incrementally more progressive. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, use a nifty little bit of evidence to fight climate change. Mm -hmm. That wasn't enough to get you off the fence, right? You're a non-endorser of Initiative 732. Mm -hmm. um, the initiative has a lot of warts, how it was designed, who it was designed by, the voices that were contributing. But nonetheless, 
these were some good ideas. Mm -hmm. If a compromise that makes the tax code more progressive and fights climate change won't get you to bite, what will get you to bite? And what are you going to do about global warming? So our state is under attack right now by carbon pollution. And I've been dedicating a considerable part of uh, our particular efforts to doing something about that. Number one, we now have a rule that is going to force down the amount of carbon pollution from the largest polluters in the state of Washington. And by law, this is not a price signal because it doesn't matter how much they have in the bank, they're going to have to ratchet down the amount of pollution coming from their emitters. And it's not based on hypothetical abstract uh, projections what a price signal would do. It's a law. And they're going to have to abide by it. And they're going to have to reduce their carbon pollution. And that is a good thing because our grandkids deserve that. So that is now in place. It's the law of the state of Washington. It's being challenged. It won't surprise you. The polluters want to sue us. They're suing the state of Washington to try to be able to pollute in unlimited amounts. They want to be able to pollute anything they want, any day, any place. I don't think that's right. I think we've got to have some reasonable restrictions on pollution. We are leading on this, and we're going to succeed on this. We are not going to fail on this. I do not believe humans were put on the planet to allow it to be destroyed by our own hand. I just don't think that's our destiny. And I'm proud of this state, and I think we're going to lead, and we're going to succeed. With that, I want to thank you for having me. I think we've solved almost Washington problems today. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you down in Olympia so we can get all these things done in 2017. Thanks very much. Thank you. Again, thank you to Governor Inslee for visiting the caucus. Thank you.